Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International Weekly Update. My name is Walton Pantland and with me is Andrew Brady. Andrew, would you like to tell us what's been happening this past week in USI? Yes, Walton, we've had a, an exciting week in that we met with FISAC, the, the finance sector of the CGIL, and they came over to London to have discussions with us about how we can give a greater a impetus to doing concrete projects with Union Solidarity International. CGIL are the Italian Confederation, yep. is that right? CGIL are the Italian Confederation representing 6.5 million workers. But we were there with the General Secretary of FISAC, the, the finance part of CGIL, to talk about how we can put in place a programme of work to give a greater meaningful dialogue to internationalism and they were very receptive to that so that was fantastic to actually have that conversation with them mm -hmm. in London and a commitment in their part and of course our part to put in place a programme of work. Our conversations of course continue with other union movements across the world including in Brazil where we've had an ongoing dialogue now for a number of months uh, with TVT the TV and communications channel of Brazilian trade unions and some of the fantastic, genuinely groundbreaking work that I think that they are doing in terms of communications and social media. And once again, the desire to work together in order to showcase best practice that is going on in our global labour movement to, to try and get trade unionists and trade unions engaging with as many social media streams as possible to communicate to the the general populace, not just to trade union members, but to, to soci the society to which we wish to speak. And that's been brilliant as well. And of course, the, just the best part of over a week ago now, there was the Durham Miners Gala, which Unite, uh, USI attended at the Unite Political School, represented by your good self, of course, Walton. So these opportunities are constantly coming up whereby we are talking to the global labour movement about how we can work together to give you know illustrations of best practice to to try and communicate our messages in a different way and that's I suppose been crowned by the fact that we've been fortunate enough to have a blog in the AFL CIO's website which is really great for mm -hmm. us to try and illustrate what USI is trying to do a little bit differently within a European labour movement context and to try and to reach out to our brothers and sisters in North America. So lots of great stuff going on mm -hmm. and programmes of work which I think are really exciting. Right, just for some labour news updates, I think for one of the most important stories for us this week is the Greek steel workers who have been on strike for the past nine months. Uh, steel workers at Eleniki Halivurgia, Hellenic Steel, just outside Athens, went on strike nine months ago after the owner of the plant, a Mr. Manessis, uh, tore up the collective agreement, reduced the working day to uh, five hours, and sacked a group of workers. The workers went on strike, and in a punitive attempt to escalate the situation, the factory manager has fired 5% of the workforce every month. So now 120 people are without work, and uh, the strike has been ongoing for nine months. The new coalition government that formed in Greece between uh, New Democracy and PASOK and DIMAR just a month ago has decided that it's necessary to open that plant by force. And uh, after, after a court order, uh, riot police stormed the steel factory in an attempt to reopen it. So we're going to try and do some work to build solidarity with those Greek steel workers who've been bravely defending their terms and conditions against the worst odds, aren't we? Absolutely, that's it's absolutely been shocking. I mean, we hear many stories about what's going on across the world on a daily basis about what's affecting our movement, but for me uh, and USI, this has been one of the most shocking ones, particularly because we've had our solidarity campaign with the Greek trade unions, trying to get their voice and message out there to a wider audience, so that examples of the Hellenic Steelworks gets the oxygen and the publicity that it deserves and we are in conversations with 
a number of trade unions with an interest within the steel sector, uh, of course including the steel workers in America, and unite about how we can give genuine practical support to this brave workforce, a workforce that has been on strike now for over nine months in order to defend jobs. I mean it's really it's really shocking to hear what is going on and these workers deserve our unconditional and full support. Mm -hmm. We've been featuring articles of course on the USI website from the steel workers themselves and that's something that we hope to progress as the months go forward, including web conferencing, podcasting, any way that we can help them get their message out. But crucially, and this is a point of USI, to give them practical support, mm -hmm. and we are determined to do that. Mm -hmm. The other union issue, which I think is very important for us to watch at the moment, is what's happening in Egypt. Uh, because essentially, we would argue, and I think a lot of people would agree with us, that the Arab Spring was really born not so much in Tahrir Square or even in Tunisia, but in the, in the factories of Egypt where uh, workers for a long time had been suffering under repressive regimes and had been unable to organize independent unions because the unions were controlled by the Mubarak regime. So particularly in the industrial town of Mahala, mm -hmm. there were, were waves of strikes, 2006-2007, uh, which um, launched a whole lot of new independent unions. I think there are now something like 200 independent mm -hmm. unions in, in Egypt and there have been attempts to create a union federation and uh, essentially the workers of Egypt feel like they made the revolution and uh, that it has failed to deliver for them. Uh, we've reported previously about how a new trade union liberties law that was supposed to give free independent trade unions the right to organize uh, has not yet been passed. Um, so what we've seen very recently, just the last couple of weeks in Egypt, is a new wave of uh, industrial action, very militant industrial action. Um, th there's been a, there's a massive textile factory in, in Mahala, which is state owned called Misr, which um, has employs 24,000 people. That's been on strike for more than a week. There's the um, Cleopatra Ceramics factory in yeah. Suez, which has been on strike. I think that employs about 12,000 people. Um, strikers at that factory were attacked by security forces with tear gas and batons. And um, another um, textile factory in Mahala El Samoli, a worker was killed by a group of vigilantes which uh, allegedly were employed by the company. Um, a number of other textile factories across the, the Nile Delta region and in Alexandria have come out in solidarity strike with those factories. So there's a huge amount of activism around trade unions and new trade unions in Egypt at the moment, all with workers feeling that the Egyptian revolution is unfinished business because they are still not seeing the right to organize and they're still not seeing fair terms and conditions. They still can't afford to eat because the food price in Egypt as in much of the rest of the world has shot up largely or partly at least because of financialization and speculation in food bubbles and the out of control financial system. Um, as we know, Egypt has a new president, uh, Morsi of the Islamic Brotherhood. Um, the Center for Trade Union and Workers Services, which is a labor service organization in Egypt that we've been in contact with, uh, are watching very closely what the Islamic Brotherhood does. They argue that this is a historically anti-union organization um, that uh, believes in charity but does not believe in the poor helping themselves. Um, Morsi has intervened, he's trying to stop the strikes. Um, the CTUWS doesn't think it's going to achieve anything unless the structural problems of, of Egyptian society are solved and workers get the right to organize. But uh, we're going to be watching very closely over the next few weeks what happens in Egypt because um, this is essentially round two in, in the unfinished process of the Arab Spring. Absolutely. I think what's important for USI is this story continues to unfold because you're quite right that this this is perhaps many people would see as the the end of the beginning and we as USI in some small way stand ready to assist our brothers and sisters in Egypt to get their message out there about the, the unfair labour laws and practices that are still in place and Hopefully over the coming weeks we will be hosting a number of web conferences, podcasting, but also a series of articles trying to get the message out there of what's going on in Egypt and it's a very, very critical time, not only in Egypt but across what many people of course call the, the Arab Spring. The same situation is developing in Tunisia once again, which many people see as the birthplace of the, the Arab 
Maghreb Spring and Tunisia is on the brink once again of exploding mm. in, in an industrial way in the same way that Egypt has because there is unfinished business about having a constitution in place. So what happened over the last year or two is merely the beginning of a long-term process and we want to be able to help our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in that part of the world get their message out there. An unbiased view from the trade union perspective. Mm -hmm. And from the Arab Spring to bad hotels, there's an international boycott of the Hyatt hotel chain, which uh, is considered possibly the worst employer in North America, certainly, where it has a very, very bad reputation for exploiting immigrant workers and female workers. Um, the American Union Unite here has produced a catalogue of human rights and worker abuses that Hyatt Hotels have been uh, responsible for. They've been supported by the AFL-CIO in calling a boycott. and uh, They've gone to the Global Union Federation, the International Union of Food, to support that boycott. There's now a global boycott of Hyatt Hotels, which is supported by big unions and big confederations across the UK and the rest of the world, uh, including Unite, the GMB, and uh, certainly unions in a lot, lot of other countries. There's a, a very good social media campaign that the American unions are running to raise awareness of uh, the, the poor conditions in hired hotels and uh, encouraging people and particularly pr progressive organizations not to use those hotels at all. So um, have a look at the, at the campaign to boycott hired hotels. Yep, absolutely. And uh, this is just another example of how trade unions and labor organizations and indeed progressive organizations around the world can help each other through social media get their message out there to a wider audience than perhaps ever before and this fantastic campaign and as Walton says that you, you must check out we'll be publicizing it on our various media streams but as yet again another illustration of the potential of social media to really shame organizations such as Hyatt Hotels and you know we look forward to you know, participating in this campaign and in other campaigns such as the Palermo's Pizza campaign mm -hmm. which has been rumbling on for a, for a number of months now and the excellent social media campaign that those workers have conducted really great examples, little gems that are in our labour movement about how to campaign effectively harnessing social media and this is in the Hyatt Hotels is another example of that and if we can magnify that and give oxygen to these campaigns, we see that as a central part of USI's role. Absolutely, Walton. And I think the other country we need to watch over the next few weeks is Spain. Um, we have seen the Marcha Negra, the march of the uh, miners from Asturias to Madrid, which has been massive and which has had a huge amount of justified support from around the world. The Solidarity Committees have raised tremendous amounts of funds to support the miners. Uh, but it's not just the miners, it's the whole of Spanish society which is under attack by austerity. We have seen massive, massive protests and demonstrations in the big cities in Spain. Andrew, do you have a perspective on this? I, don't, I think everybody is watching Spain with uh, great concern. And a number of weeks ago in one of our weekly roundups, we of course said that Spain was the next country that the markets would attack and we are, we are exactly seeing that. We see on a daily basis now that the, the bailout of the, the banks isn't enough mm -hmm. and the markets once again and unsurprisingly are gearing up for their next attack on the state of Spain itself, not just the financial sector and you know seeking to pressurise that country into getting a bailout for the Spanish state and with that the the extreme austerity program that comes with that, if it hasn't been enough in Spain. The reason why the Marcha Negra of course took place is because of the absolutely scathing cuts of investment within that sector and that's before the mm -hmm. Spanish state has been, as it looks likely now, being forced into taking a bailout for the whole of the country rather than just mm -hmm. the banks. The austerity that has been rolled out across Europe is absolutely frightening. In Spain, we've got youth unemployment of over 50%. 50 percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's absolutely shocking. Mm -hmm. Employment levels, unemployment levels at 25 percent, and we have seen several Spanish regions in the last couple of uh, days actually going to the Spanish state seeking support 
I mean, what is happening in in Spain is absolutely is frightening, and you know, I I think as the markets pressure that country into trying to get another bailout, the austerity is yet the the deeper levels of austerity are yet to come, and we in USI are going to try our level best to help get the workers' message out there. In the coming months, we will be working with the the Gibraltar branch of Unite to work with our comrades in Spain uh, and the CGT in particular and the CCOO about how we can develop a program of work that gets the Spanish workers' message out there to a wider audience in the same way that the Marcha Negra and the Miners campaign has. We need to externalise that uh, across all the sectors of the, the Spanish economy and if USI can help, we will certainly do so and we look forward uh, to assisting our brothers and sisters in Spain as best as we possibly can through the Unite branch in Gibraltar. And of course we need to remember that none of this austerity is necessary. You may have seen recent news reports about the amount of money which is squirreled away in tax havens and hidden away in dark corners of the financial system. Uh, it's been estimated now at uh, 21 trillion dollars, which would more than solve the Eurozone crisis and a number of other huge structural problems with the world. So the problem is money hidden away and an investment strike austerity is absolutely not necessary. It is a political pro project to shift wealth from working people to the rich people. And uh, only by union solidarity can do we have any hope of resisting this and building a better and more sustainable future. Yeah, and just to echo that point, Walton, I mean, one of the, the greatest myths that our opponents on the right perpetuate is the, the spectre of an industrial strike, legitimate industrial action. The biggest spectre that's facing our world is a capital strike, as Walton's alluded to, $21 trillion squirreled away in bank accounts, businesses not investing when they could. That is the biggest threat facing mm -hmm. not only Europe but our world is the capital strike and as a political and economic project that they are embarking upon in order to give them the excuse from their perspective to further attack the labour laws in the various nation states across our world. Andrew, that's all I have this week. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, very exciting. Uh, I, I know I'm probably guilty of saying this on a regular basis, but we will be having Professor Steve Keane joining us in a webinar on uh, Sunday, uh, the 31st of July. At 10 p.m. GMT, will he will be discussing with us the global financial crisis, how he was one of the, the few economists on a regular basis to predict that this was going to happen and really to get his insight mm -hmm. as to where do we really go from now. This builds on the previous conversations that we've had with our good friends Yanis Varoufakis and Stephanie Kelton and so we're really looking forward to that. We'll be advertising that event on our various social media streams on Facebook, on Twitter, on Snippet and Google Plus. The various social media streams that we are harnessing to try and get a union message out there so I'm really looking forward mm -hmm. to that and I hope that you can join us and once again we will be guilty of this on a regular basis but of course we have our branch affiliation strategy underway which was launched in the beginning of July and I'm delighted to say a number of union branches have already started to affiliate in that very short space of time including some very generous donations to USI to support the work that we are doing, the campaigns that we have underway in Greece, but also our campaign in India where we seek to organise thousands of workers in the brick kiln industry. It's a really exciting time for USI and we hope to work with you over the coming months to help support some of the fantastic work that your organisation may be doing, that your union branch may be doing. We are here to help and we are here to serve our movement so um, I'm pretty excited about the months to come but please join us for Professor Steve Keane webinar. Thank you for joining us in creating links across borders. Let's build union solidarity together. <laughs>